What's up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome to the show. As always, thank you for tuning in. I got an article here from Politico. John Eastman finds himself in the headlines once again uh, in the last 48 hours. We talked about him before. John Eastman is, um, they're trying, they're attempting to take John Eastman's bar license. They're trying to disbar him in California. So I wanted to talk about that. We have, we got a lot to get into, folks. I wanted to get into some news about RFK and his VP pick, which is clear as day now which side RFK is going. He is clearly going to the left. So I have some critiques of his new VP. And let's just say maybe her, maybe no critiques about her per se, but I have some critiques about her inconsistencies. Uh, she is from Oakland, California, the same place where RFK announced her as his VP. And we're going to get into how bad is Oakland, California. So I wanted to get into that. And then I also have another story about RFK Jr., where Donald Trump made a prediction on True Social that's actually quite shocking if it becomes true. And we all know how right Donald Trump is on a lot of his predictions. So if this turns out to be true, I think this may be the straw to break the camel's back as far as Democrats, that this is a justice system that's being weaponized by the Biden administration and other Democrats. RFK Jr. is running as an independent because Democrats have essentially kept him off the ballot. Yeah, real real defenders of democracy there. Uh, essentially, what it all boils down to is Joe Biden doesn't want any opponents, right? Like a real Vladimir Putin, some third world banana republic election stuff. And so we have a whole lot to get into. I also want to end the show off with a awesome story about Donald Trump visiting the slain officer, the NYPD officer, and something Donald Trump did that, that frankly is, is something only Donald Trump can do. Um, and it's actually quite incredible. I figured I'd end the show off with a little bit of hope and something positive for a change. It's actually kind of a bittersweet story because obviously we're talking about a slain NYPD officer, but what Donald Trump does for the family is absolutely incredible. So if you want to find out what that is, make sure you stay tuned. If you want to support the show, you can download the podcast on all major podcast platforms. You can also find the show on Rumble. You can follow us there. And if you want to get a hold of me directly, you can get a hold of me at stephentoryyellowshow at gmail.com. So without further ado, let's do this. You're listening to The Stephen Toriello Show, building a platform of liberty for people in search of truth with a dash of hope and a life worth living. The Stephen Toriello Show. And now, here's Stephen. All right. All right. Let's get into this. So to start out with, I want to actually, you know what, before we do that, I want to get into what is lawfare. It's, it's a term that we've been hearing a lot lately. We've certainly been using it on this show. Uh, you know, Democrats want to pretend like it doesn't exist, but lawfare is a real thing. And we're watching it play out right now in front of our eyes. And I can prove it to you. So lawfare is referring to a strategy of using legal systems and institutions to achieve a goal or to advance a political or military agenda. And when you go down into the context of all this stuff, one of the contexts to be used, one of the contexts it could be used in is political groups. Political groups or individuals may use legal actions such as lawsuits for defamation to silence or discredit opponents. That's actually quite shocking. And this approach can also be used to challenge electoral results or to impose legal obstacles that hinder political activities. Wow. Man, oh, man. That sounds a whole lot like what Democrats are doing. And I know people like Stephen A. Smith and a lot of my fellow, you know, more sane, rational Democrats want to pretend like lawfare isn't being waged right now by Democrats by one side. OK, there's no this lawfare stuff isn't being used by both sides. It's not tit for tat. No, no. It is one side wielding this sword of lawfare at its enemies. All right. Using the justice system, weaponizing it against political opponents. It's only one side doing this. All right. There's no confusion here. There's, this is not tit for tat, you know, revenge politics. No, that's it. And for Democrats to pretend like Joe Biden has nothing to do with it is absurd. 
Okay, Joe Biden was the one that recommended the Logan Act when it came to Michael, uh, General Michael Flynn. So Joe Biden is perfectly capable of of making recommendations of ju- weaponizing the justice system against political opponents. So we we know this. And also there's been article after article of Joe Biden pissed off at his staffers because the 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 persecutions, the prosecutions of Donald Trump aren't moving fast enough. So what does that tell you? It tells you everything you need to know. Of course, Joe Biden knows about these prosecutions against his opponent. You know, Democrats want to pretend like Joe Biden is oblivious to these prosecutions and he has nothing to do with it. That is just bogus. You got you you got a former DOJ official that left the Biden administration to go help Alvin Bragg prosecute Donald Trump for free pro bono. All right. So so it's not like, you know, it's not like Joe Biden doesn't know anything about this. This guy left the DOJ, went to go help Alvin Bragg in New York, and he's doing it for free. That is essentially like Joe Biden sending sending his best to go take out his political opponent. So I don't want to hear it from Democrats. You know, they think the American people are so dumb. It's 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 actually quite uh, offensive. I, I find it very offensive how these politicians and Democrats and these and these people think the American people are so dumb. So anyways, to speaking of lawfare, that's actually why I wanted to start out with that term, because it's actually going to be kind of the theme of today's show. I want to get into all these stories really quick. So I got an article here from NBC News. Judge recommends John Eastman to be disbarred in California. And for those of you that don't know who John Eastman is, John Eastman was Donald Trump's attorney that helped him with the uh, challenging the certification of the 2020 election, a perfectly legit process, a legal process uh, that, you know, didn't work because Mike Pence didn't go through with it. So, I, I you know, I, I find it really disgusting how, you know, they're, they're attacking all these attorneys, Donald Trump's attorneys, for challenging an election when I guarantee you, mark my words, Mark the date. It is March 28th, 2024. Democrats will be using the same strategies against Donald Trump when he wins in 2024. Mark it down. So this is something that Democrats do all the time. They accuse their opponents of what they themselves are guilty of. They are so hypocritical. They are the standard, folks. It's one standard, Democrat standard. That is it. And so they will absolutely use the same strategy that John Eastman used in 2020 to try and challenge the 2024 election. Mark it down. They're going to try all they can. You're going to. So and then all of a sudden it's not going to be election. It's not going to be uh, trying to overturn the election results. It's going to be Democrats challenge the 2024 election. You'll see. I'm telling you, we all know that's how it's going to be. Anyways, John Eastman was the top attorney. He was a law professor. I mean, the guy's credentials is a mile long. I actually read his credentials today. I mean, I mean, you want to talk about an overachiever, man. <laughs> this guy this guy is just off the charts with achievements. Like if he was a general in the military, he'd be one of those generals that are just covered in medals. So this guy may be the most accredited, most, you know, the the best constitutional lawyer in the country, if not the world. And so, you know, I I don't think this guy is is trying to introduce any novel legal theories without, you know, without it having a little bit of truth. And we know that it has some we know that his legal theories had some teeth to him because three of the Supreme Court justices wanted to take up his case. Multiple senators wanted to take up his case. There's a lot of people that agreed with John Eastman when it came to this challenging the certification of the election results. And essentially, you know, what Democrats want people to believe is that Mike Pence is nothing more than just a ceremonial piece in the process, that the, pre- that the vice president is not allowed to reject the certifications and send them back to the states so that they can be recertified. No, Mike Pence is simply there to just, I don't know, pass the certifications from one end to the other. I don't know. But that's what they want people to believe. And like I said just a minute ago, Democrats will be challenging the certification of the 2024 election. Mark it down. If not, try and steal the whole thing outright. They'll try and, trust me, they're going to try everything in their power to keep Donald Trump out of the White House. That you can take to the bank. Anyway, so a judge recommends John Eastman be disbarred in California. On Wednesday, 
John Eastman, a co-defendant of Donald Trump in the Georgia election interference case, be disbarred in California. It says Eastman's misconduct and balancing the aggravation and mitigation, the court recommends that Eastman be disbarred, wrote Judge Yvette D. Rowland of the State Bar Courts uh, State Bar Courts Hearing Department in Los Angeles. Los Angeles, Democrat city. I mean, don't Democrats ever connect the dots? You got all these prosecutions happening in Democrat states by Democrat judges with Democrat attorney generals with most likely Democrat juries because they're in Democrat, Democrat strongholds. I mean, it's, it's obvious what's going on here. Everybody can see it, but Democrats. Quote, after full consideration of the record, the court found that the State Bar of California's chief trial counsel's office had satisfied its burden of proving a vast majority of its allegations against Eastman. Eastman was hit with 11 disciplinary charges tied to allegations that he promoted a strategy that wasn't backed by facts or law, which entailed a plan to have then-Vice President Mike Pence reject electoral votes cast for Joe Biden during a joint session of Congress on January 6, 2021. So this is the problem I have. You guys remember uh, who introduced the legal... Essentially, what they're saying is John Eastman should be disbarred because... He promoted a strategy that wasn't backed by facts or law. So this is the standard now for trying to take somebody's law license by introducing a strategy not backed by facts or law. If that's the case, then every single Democrat involved in the impeachment, involved in the Russia collusion hoax, and most most recently, the two lawyers that introduced the novel legal theory to try and remove Donald Trump off the presidential ballot. That was a novel legal theory that they knew wasn't backed by facts or the law. How do we know it wasn't backed by the law or the Constitution? Because all Supreme Court justices, every single one of them, voted against this novel legal theory put forth by, I think his name is Michael Ludig, used to be a former judge, but now he is a big anti-Trump, tried to take Trump out by all means necessary lawyer, who introduced, let's face it, a novel legal theory that wasn't backed by facts or the law. Because it got slapped down nine to zero. Listen, when you introduce a novel legal theory, okay, that gets slapped down by a unanimous vote with three liberal justices on the court, you know it's a novel legal theory that should have never been brought. It was a strategy that should have never been brought. And so why aren't these two people that brought this novel legal this novel legal theory, why aren't they being disbarred? Hmm? Because We all know that it's a two-tier justice system. There's two standards. There's one for Donald Trump and one for everybody else. Donald Trump is the exception to the Constitution. Donald Trump is the exception to the rule of law, to the justice system. And so it's perfectly fine for Michael Ludig and the other whack job that brought these novel legal theories to try and remove a presidential candidate off the ballot. And they're not going to be, they're not even going to be challenged. Their law licenses won't even be brought up to a ethics court or a a disbarment court, period. And so this is why Democrats continue this lawfare. This is because they get away with it, because there's no accountability. If Michael Ludig and this other guy, this other whack job that brought this novel legal theory, if they were, if these two guys were to be held accountable for, for bringing that stupid legal theory to try and remove Donald Trump off the ballot, then we would stop seeing this garbage. The reason why we have all these novel legal theories, these first impression cases, these unprecedented events happening in our country is because Democrats are never held accountable. Okay, they don't understand anything else but power. So until you fight fire with fire, until you take an eye for an eye, until there is some retribution for this stuff, it's going to continue. And like I said in previous episodes, Donald Trump has to seek retribution at some point. You know, when he gets in the office, if he does not seek retribution on the people that tried to interfere in our federal election, I'm sorry, but they're going to do it again and again and again. And we'll get to a point to where only Democrats are allowed to bring novel legal theories and anybody that challenges them or holds them accountable will go will be will be arrested or imprisoned, just like Donald Trump. I mean, it's so freaking wild. The, the two, the, the obvious two standards of justice here. And so that was my point with John Eastman. He is, you know, just the latest victim in this lawfare that's being waged by Democrats the last eight years. Um, the Democrats war on the rule of law. And so what is disbarment exactly? 
So it's actually not that big of a deal. It doesn't seem like I actually looked this up. So when a lawyer is disbarred, it means that they have been removed from the list of attorneys authorized to practice law in a given jurisdiction due to misconduct. Getting a law license reinstated after being disbarred is difficult, but not impossible, depending on the jurisdiction and the specific circumstances surrounding the disembarment. The disbarment. Process for reinstatement, a waiting period. There's typically a mandatory waiting period before an application for reinstatement can be filed. This period varies by jurisdiction, but can range from a few years to indefinitely. Uh, the disbarred attorney must file an application for reinstatement with the state bar or relevant legal authority. Demonstration of rehabilitation. The applicant must demonstrate that they have been rehabilitated and are fit to practice law. This might include evidence of ethical conduct, community service, continued study of the law, or treatment for any issues that contributed to the disbarment. And then uh, any outstanding fines, fees, or restitution must be typically paid before reinstatement. Some jurisdictions require the disbarred attorney to retake the bar exam or fulfill other educational requirements. Um, so yeah, I, I see, I don't see, um, John Eastman going, you know, going forever without his law license. I totally, I can, I could see him getting his law license back in no time. And besides this happened in California, John Eastman come to Florida, man. I'll be, I, I can almost guarantee you the state of Florida would be more than happy to have your knowledge in the law down here in Florida. And as far as Michael Ludig goes and the other whack job that brought in the novel legal theory to, to bar Trump from being on the ballot, they can stay wherever they're at and they should actually be disbarred. Those two people shouldn't be practicing law. Like those are the exact type of people that shouldn't have a law license. They're dangerous. They're irresponsible. Okay. They, they should not have their law license, period. And same thing goes for people like Adam Schiff, same people, same thing goes for all the other whack job attorneys that used their law license that used their influence to go and target their political opponents, period. John Eastman should be the last person losing his law license because he brought in a theory that challenged the election. You know, it's just, God, we can get into, we can talk about it all day, but we got to move on. We got a lot to get into. So that story, so you should be hearing a lot about the John Eastman disbarment. You know, essentially what it is, what I think it is, is Democrats are they're trying to take out anybody that may be able to represent Trump or defend Trump. They're trying to take them out one by one using lawfare. I think John Clark or uh, Jason Clark is dealing with the same thing, which is another Trump attorney dealing with the exact same thing. In fact, I think he was in trial today. It's funny how all these Republicans, all Republicans are the ones in trials, in courts, being disbarred. You mean to tell me that there's no, no Democrats out there? That all the Democrats are all innocent. None of them, none of them, none of them are being accused of, you know, bringing novel legal theories. Look at Adam Schiff, dude. That guy cost the American taxpayer millions of dollars with his lies, weaponizing the impeachment process. I mean, look at Nancy Pelosi, Liz Cheney, all these people. I mean, to tell me all of them are innocent. It's just Republicans that need to have that need to be disbarred. It's just Republicans that need to face trial. It's all bogus, and they know it, man. And, and that's why I say there must be retribution on this, or these people are never going to stop. Never. Um, so that's what lawfare is. And then speaking of, um, and then kind of shifting gears here, just real quick, this is breaking. This just came out at uh, five minutes ago. Comer invites Joe Biden to testify before Oversight Committee about his family's influence peddling scheme. This is a hat tip to the one and only Christina Layla, my favorite writer over there at Gateway Pundit. House Oversight Chairman James Comer on Thursday invited Joe Biden to testify before his committee on his family's influence peddling scheme. Quote, the committee has accounted for over $24 million that has flowed from foreign sources to you, your family and their business associates. The committee has identified no legitimate services to merit such lucrative payments. You have reportedly denied playing any role in your family's business activities, but the committee has amassed evidence, including bank records and witness testimony, that wholly contradicts your position on these matters, Comer wrote in a letter to Joe Biden. Comer called Biden now for taking money from China. Quote, you have asserted your family has not made money from China. 
However, the committee has identified approximately $10 million originating from China connected to Biden influence peddling. Former business associates from your family have testified that you personally met with multiple individuals from China who have collectively sent millions of dollars to your family. Many of these meetings and business development occurred while you were vice president or campaigning to be president, Comer said. James Comer said Biden needs to answer for pressuring Ukraine to fire Viktor Shokin, the solicitor general who was investigating the Ukrainian gas company tied to Hunter Biden. Comer added in February 2014, the richest woman in Russia paid into your son and his business associates company $3.5 million just days before the Russian invasion of Ukraine. In an attempt to avoid U.S. sanctions on Russia bank accounts, to date, the Russian oligarch has not been subject to any public sanctions. This is obvious, folks. This is so obvious. So you mean to tell me the richest woman in Russia paid Hunter Biden and his business associates $3.5 million days before the Russian invasion of Ukraine and in an attempt to avoid U.S. sanctions on Russia bank accounts, the Russia oligarch has not been subject to any public sanctions So they're the only ones that they're the only Russians that aren't being sanctioned. Nobody finds that a little bit coincidental. That doesn't throw up any red flag for Democrats. (laughs) It's so incredible, man. Of course, everybody knows the Bidens are corrupt. There's no denying this stuff, man. You watch testimony from former Biden business partners. I don't know how many is there, three, four? Every single one of them says, yeah, Joe Biden was pretty damn involved in all the business transactions. He was pretty damn involved in the businesses. Joe Biden was the business. (laughs) So it's like, I I find it incredible how Democrats can deny or even still believe that Joe Biden had nothing to do with the son's business deal, his son's businesses. Here's the, here's the $40 million question. What goods and services did the Bidens provide to earn millions upon millions of dollars? What was it? Anybody know? Is there a reason why there's 22 shell companies? What do they give? It's obvious, folks. It's, it's influence peddling. Some of the biggest stuff, the, one of the biggest problems we're having within our government. And the Bidens are probably by far the worst. If the Bidens are this bad, imagine what other people's families look like. Imagine how much influence other families are selling to our foreign adversaries. If the Bidens, the Bidens just got caught, you know, think of how many senators, think of how many public officials are peddling influence that have kids that didn't leave their laptop in a computer repair shop. The only way we know any of this is one, Republicans won the midterms. And number two, Joe Biden's idiot kid Hunter left a laptop in a computer repair store. That's it. I mean, that's the only way that's the only reason why we know this stuff. And so I think we're to a point to where Democrats are just in this like deep state of don, uh, this deep state of denialism. Like, you know, the, Joe Biden is this outstanding figure. He's the lesser of two evils. No, Joe Biden cheats. Joe Biden steals. And Joe Biden peddles influence to our foreign adversaries. I'll give you one better. Let me put it this way. Joe Biden. All right. Joe Biden himself may be the closest thing we have ever had to a actual traitor to our country, in our White House. All right? I don't throw that word around very often. I'm not one of those people that accuse everyone I don't like of being a traitor. Joe Biden is a traitor to the United States. He sold his power and influence for money to our foreign adversaries. That's what happened. Joe Biden willfully retained classified documents for years and years and years. Stole them out of a skiff. How do we know he stole them out of a skiff? Because how else does somebody get classified documents? Not only that, but he shared classified information with unauthorized sources. All these things we know for a fact Joe Biden did. (laughs) This is what's shocking to me. And he's not going to be prosecuted because he's too old and because he's a Democrat. That's why. Only one side of the one side of the aisle gets gets uh, gets prosecuted here, folks. That's it. And so I think, you know, it's unfortunate that Republicans are awful at messaging. You know, it's, un- it's unfortunate that Republicans, they're falling short on this impeachment thing. There's no way they're going to get an impeachment of Joe Biden. Should they? Absolutely. 
Would I want them to? Sure. You know, but during doing it during an election year, we actually called this on the show months, maybe even over a year ago, um, that if, you know, that Republicans are going to slow walk this thing, they're going to use it for, you know, an election tool. It's not going to actually happen. It's uh, we knew this. Why? Because Republicans, they're not built for this, man. They are not Democrats when it comes to weaponizing the justice system. They just don't know how to do it. It is clear and obvious that Republicans are not Democrats when it comes to using legal lawfare. That is it. They just don't know how to do it. They're like a bunch of, of they're nerds, man. They're a bunch of weak ass nerds. All right. They're, they're nerds that, that wanted, that had a dream of, of working in public office their entire life. That is it. These people cannot use, they cannot wield the sword of justice like Democrats. <laughs> that is clear as day. And so it's unfortunate that Republicans are really botching the messaging on this. I mean, this is so bad. The, the Biden corruption is so bad. I mean, bad, bad. I mean, it doesn't get any worse. Like, we've never seen this level of corruption in our country before. Never. I mean, you know, if for people out there that may be listening that aren't, you know, aren't really in tune to politics a lot, I'm going to tell you this right here, right now. Out of all the scandals that we've had in this country, I'm talking Watergate, none, none even hold a candle to the level of corruption in the Biden family. We've never had this level of evidence. You're talking eyewitnesses, former business partners, receipts, documents. We've never had such a corrupt family in our White House. This, I can guarantee you, take it to the bank. These, this entire administration is forever going to be marked with an asterisk as the most bizarre, most corrupt, most deceiving administration to ever step foot in the White House. It, it is the most bizarre and crazy thing to me. Democrats are in like full time uh, overdrive trying to defend Joe Biden and they can't do it. They can't. You can't defend. How are you going to defend an eyewitness? H how are you going to defend? How are you going to defend against eyewitness testimony? You can't. How are you going to defend against bank records? The only thing they don't have is a video of Joe Biden grabbing a bag of money from a Chinese oligarch. Like, and, and it wouldn't even surprise me if that was out there somewhere. <laughs> To be honest, it's so bad. It's so bad. Just, you know, that was for, you know, anybody that may be listening that's not really into politics. This is bad. The Biden corruption is bad, very bad. And it will go down in history as one of the most corrupt families to ever serve in, in, in public office. Guaranteed. All right. So switching gears here, we went from disbarment of John Eastman to impeachment of Joe Biden, I want to get into some RFK. And then towards the end, we'll get into that Trump story, which is actually pretty incredible. Um, so RFK Jr. has been in the headlines for the last 48 hours for who we picked as his VP, Nicole Shanahan. So who is Nicole Shanahan? She is the philanthropist picked by Robert F. Kennedy Jr. as his 2024 running mate. Nicole Shanahan is a California lawyer and philanthropist who's never held elected office to be his running mate, to be RFK's running mate in his independent bid for president announced on Tuesday. An unconventional choice, Shanahan, who is 38, brings youth and considerable wealth to Kennedy's long shot campaign, but is little known outside Silicon Valley. This was the biggest mistake this campaign could make. Like, what were they thinking? You know, I, I, I really am shocked that RFK picked her as his VP. I can't imagine he did. They're trying, they're, they're trying so desperately now to consolidate the leftist votes. They feel like they got the never Trump votes, the Republicans. But by doing this, I think they just completely ruined their chances of gaining any former Trump voters uh, to, 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 to get their votes. I think all those people that voted for Trump and weren't going to vote for him this time are now going to go back home and vote for Donald Trump. So if you want to know how far left this woman is, listen to this. Shanahan leads the Bia Echo Foundation, an organization she founded to direct money toward issues including women's reproductive science, criminal justice reform, and environmental causes. 
She also is a Stanford University fellow and was the founder and chief executive of Clear Access IP, a patent management firm that was sold in 2020. Shanahan was married to Google co-founder Sergey Brin from 2018 to 2023, and they have a young daughter. She was raised in San Francisco Bay Area where Kennedy made his announcement. Remember, San Francisco Bay Area, Oakland. On Tuesday, she grew up in Oakland. On Tuesday, Shanahan talked about her hand her hard scrabble upbringing in Oakland, the daughter of a mother who immigrated from China and an Irish German American father plagued by substance abuse, yada yada yada. Before the announcement, Kennedy's campaign manager and daughter-in-law, Emeritus Fox Kennedy, praised Shanahan's work on behalf of honest governance, racial equity. She said the work, quote, reflects many of our country's most urgent needs. That right there, ladies and gentlemen, should tell you everything you need to know about Nicole Shanahan, R.F. Kennedy Jr.'s running mate. Racial equity. That right there is the key word. This is how you know somebody is a leftist. When they say racial equity, then you know. You know that they are a leftist. Not racial equality, racial equity. Equal outcomes. This is how you know somebody's a leftist. And this is who RFK Jr. picked as his VP. It's really disappointing. I had a lot more faith in RFK Jr. than this. But this is wonderful for Trump voters and Donald Trump. There's without a doubt. This is going to leech so much, so many voters off of Joe Biden. It's not even funny. And this is exactly what RFK Jr. is trying to do. One could say almost like a... uh, double agent for the Trump campaign, (laughs) because why would you do this? You know, RFK Jr.'s main, uh, his main objective was to attract the independents, the people that didn't want to vote for Trump or Biden. But nobody's fallen for this stuff, man. Would you brought in probably one of the most radical leftists you could possibly think of as your VP? You just destroyed it, man. So this is great news for Donald Trump. Um, And Donald Trump actually said that. According to campaign finance records, Shanahan has long donated to Democratic candidates, including giving the maximum amount allowed to Kennedy when he was still pursuing the party's nomination before switching to an independent bid in October. Not switching. He was essentially forced as an independent because Democrats wouldn't let him on the ballots in any of the states. So much for defenders of democracy, huh? (laughs) It was unclear if Shanahan would use her own money on the campaign, but she has already opened her wallet to back Kennedy. She was the driving force and the primary donor behind the Super Bowl ad produced as a pro-Kennedy Super PAC, American Values 2024, for which she contributed $4 million. Uh, The Super PAC can accept unlimited funds, but 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 is legally barred from coordinating with Kennedy's team. But as a candidate for vice president, Shanahan can give unlimited sums to the campaign directly. That's potentially a huge boost for Kennedy's expensive push to get on the ballot in all 50 states. An endeavor, she has said, will cost $15 million and require collecting more than 1 million signatures. I don't see RFK Jr. having a problem with that. I'm going to be honest right now. Every single Biden voter that I know, every single one, there has not been one of them that has said they're voting for Biden again. Every single one of them says they're voting for RFK Jr. So this is going to siphon so many votes off of Joe Biden. It's not even funny. And that's exactly what the Biden campaign is worried about. This is from the New York Post. Trump leads Biden by points in new national poll. So former President Donald Trump is leading Joe Biden by by five points nationally in 2024. White House race, according to a new poll. Fox News survey released Wednesday shows ex-commander-in-chief leading the incumbent 50% to 45 in a head-to-head rematch of the 2020 election. It represents the largest lead Trump has has had over Biden in a Fox News national poll, according to the outlet. Trump maintains his edge over Biden even in a hypothetical five-way race, which is exactly how you need to look at this race. Anytime you look at a poll, you need don't look at it with Trump versus Biden. This is a Trump versus Biden versus Kennedy. And you even have other candidates with this guy, uh, Cornell West. With third party candidates included in the survey, 43 percent of registered voters indicated they would back Trump, while 38 percent said they would vote for Biden. 
So independent candidate RFK Jr. received 12% support, a three-point drop from November, and Green Party and unaffiliated candidates Jill Stein and Cornell West received just 2%. The poll has also found that just 22% of respondents say that they are, quote, better off than four years ago. So just imagine that. Just 22% of respondents said they are better off than four years ago. <laughs> it's not good. More than half of the respondents, 52%, said they are worse off. These are awful numbers for Joe Biden. More voters trusted Trump over Biden on issues related to immigration by 18 points and the economy by 15 points, whereas the incumbent is more trusted on issues related to the election integrity by six points and health care by three points. The four issues were rated as top concerns for voters heading into November, according to the poll. The president's overall job rating was measured at a lowly 41 percent, a one point drop from last month, with 58 percent disapproving of his of his performance as commander in chief. The survey of more than 1,000 registered voters was, con was conducted between March 22 and March 25 and had a margin of error of three percentage points. 58% disapproval rating. That is awful. Disgusting. That, <laughs> that is awful. This is why I said that the closer we get to the election, the more desperate Biden gets, the more crazy this guy's going to act like he's going to be like throwing stuff in the Oval Office. Why isn't Donald Trump in prison yet? He's essentially trying to get to an election with no opponents. <laughs> like a true, like Vladimir Putin, Stalin kind of way. This guy is off his rocker authoritarian. There is no doubt about it. Joe Biden is very conceited. Joe Biden has no self-esteem, serious self-esteem issues. And that what do you want to say? He's a chameleon. The guy stands for everything and nothing at the same exact time. He's a real career politician. And his numbers, these numbers are awful, just awful. And Kennedy hurts him the most. And I knew that was going to happen. I actually didn't think that before because I was actually surprised by how many former Trump voters were voting for RFK. But a lot of those Trump voters that said that, you know, months ago are now voting for Donald Trump. So he's he's gaining. These people are going home. You know, the, the never Trumpers, they're going to vote for Trump. You know, they're, they're not going to vote for nobody. Um, some will. Donald Trump's not going to get everybody. But the goal here is, is to outvote the margin of cheating. That is the goal. And so it, it, it amazes me that it's even this close with how bad the world is right now. I mean, these people need to look around. I mean, the world is on fire and Joe Biden is is eating ice cream cones. <laughs> it's just so. And don't let the leftist prop the media try and convince you that because Joe Biden is, is you know, uh, Joe Biden is earning 10 times more donations than Donald Trump. Don't let that fool you. That's exactly how it always is. Democrats always make more money than Republicans and Joe Biden in particular because he's the party of the rich. He is the his backers, his biggest base are the rich elite billionaires, millionaires. That's it. The Democrat Party has turned into the party of the rich elite. Go figure. It's now the Republicans that are the party of working middle class. And how do we know this? Check this out. Black men are poised to take Trump to the White House. Biden insiders are worried. This is an article from The Independent. In February, on the eve of South Carolina primary, former President Donald Trump spoke before the Black Conservative Federation in the Palmetto State's capital city of Columbia. There he tried to link his own legal battles with the plight of black men who have been unfairly discriminated against in the U.S. Quote, I got indicted a second time and a third time and a fourth time, he told the audience. And a lot of people said that's why the black people like me, because they've been hurt so badly and discriminated against, and they will actually view me as I'm being discriminated against. He's right. He's absolutely right. This is, this is without a doubt, lawfare being waged against Donald Trump. He's hated by both sides. I don't know about you, but the guy who's hated by both parties, that's who I want. The twice impeached, four times indicted former presidents, this is, they got to add this in the article. This is a leftist article. The twice impeached, four times indicted former president's remarks were equal parts clumsy and revealing. 
Trump has long seen an opening to improve his standing with African-American voters, especially black men. It's why, despite his often harsh rhetoric about law and order, he signed on to bipartisan efforts to reform the criminal justice system during his presidency. Yeah, the First Step Act. You know, people now have a stark contrast between Joe Biden and Donald Trump. Donald Trump has done more for the black community in four years than Joe Biden has done his entire 50-year career. I'll give you one better. Donald Trump has done more in four years for the black community than Joe Biden, Nancy Pelosi, and Chuck Schumer combined. All right? We're talking over a hundred years worth of public service. Donald Trump has done more in just four for the black community. This is why people like him. They see the contrast now. For the people that got involved in politics in 2016, they didn't really have a stark contrast like they do now. They went from nothing to getting into politics to seeing Donald Trump and then seeing Joe Biden. And now they have a, a record. They have a record to compare. It's, it's no wonder Joe Biden's numbers are tanking. The guy's freaking awful, man. I'm surprised he even has a, 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 the, the approval rating he does. It's shocking. Who are these people? Where are they at? I mean, are they completely blind or oblivious to what's going on? Although he and his advisors boasted during his 2020 re-election bid that upwards of a fifth of black men would vote for him, Trump lost black voters to Joe Biden by significant margins when Americans went to the polls four years ago. Yet Biden has struggled to keep that key demographic in the fold during his time in the White House. Gee, I wonder why. Because he hasn't done jack crap for the black community. Like, what? Like it's clear and obvious. During Donald Trump, you had record amounts of black-owned businesses. The black communities were prospering. All Americans were prospering. You know, prosperity brings unity. You know, it's, it's you know, Democrats always try and divide and conquer, man. They're always into this identity politics. And it's, it's, it's because they are the party of racism, going back to its conception in the Confederacy. That there is no such thing as this big switch they keep telling people about. It was the Democrats were the Confederacy against the Republicans, the abolishers, the, the, the abolitionists, okay? The, the party of Lincoln, the Republicans, <laughs> that was it. Democrats have changed. There was no big flip. I'm tired of Democrats using this. No, they support a party that, is, that stands for anti-Semitism, that stands for identity politics, segregation, Jim Crow laws, eugenics, all the crap, okay? All the crap. The most evil stuff that has ever happened in this country was done by Democrats. And people are starting to see it. Thank God. Anyways, so yeah, black men are, are starting to think uh, through their politics and not just party. Byron Donalds told The Independent. That's so true, man. They're starting to see. We're all starting to see. We're all Americans here. Whether you're black, white, brown, don't matter. We're all here. We're all Americans. That is our common interest. Okay? Prosperity brings unity. Disparity brings division. That's it. It's the easiest way in the book. And people look around. They see the, they see the death and destruction around the world. It's no wonder they don't want Joe Biden. I, I can't think of anything more oblivious, more dumb than looking at the situation we're in right now. Being like, yeah. This is great. We should vote for four more years of this. <laughs> what, is, well, what, is, what is wrong with these people, man? Good God. All right. Anyways, end the show off. We're almost done here. I got one more article. Leave off with some somewhat of a, of a good story. It's kind of sweet. It's kind of a sweet and sour kind of story. Um... Let's see here. Oh, before we, I can't believe I missed this. This was the, the prediction Donald Trump made. So I should have actually talked about this. This is my screw up. I should have talked about this when we were talking to RFK. Former President Donald Trump launched a scathing attack on third party candidate Robert F. Kennedy Jr. and his newly announced running mate Nicole Shanahan. The 77 year old not only bashed RFK Jr.'s political career, but, but claimed he would likely be indicted soon. This is crazy. So Trump criticized Kennedy's political stance, labeling him as the most radical left candidate in the race and a promoter of the Green New Scam. Trump expressed his belief that Kennedy's candidacy would benefit America by drawing votes away from his rival, President Joe Biden. Quote, Kennedy is a radical left Democrat, always will be, he wrote via Truth Social. 
Quote, it's great for MAGA, but the communists will make it very hard for him to get on the ballot. As Kennedy gains access to more state ballots, the issue of his potential impact on the election has escalated. Financial support from Tim Mellon, a prominent Trump donor, has fueled speculations on Kennedy's ability to sway votes. Financial Times' Edward Luce highlighted this point, stating polls show RFK Jr. would draw most of his support from Biden. But here it goes. While Trump's team largely believes, at least for now, that RFK Jr. is more dangerous to Biden than the former president, Trini added they also acknowledge that RFK Jr.'s platform is attractive to many anti-establishment Trump voters. According to Real Clear Politics, Kennedy is polling higher than any independent candidate in recent elections. In an average of recent polls, Kennedy is sitting at 15% of likely voters choosing the legacy candidate over President Biden at 35.5%, former President Trump polling at 39.8%. That is the key. So Donald Trump predicts that RFK Jr. will be indicted by the Biden administration and Democrats. Ooh, buddy, I can totally see it. If it happened, it wouldn't be surprising to me, but I think it would be a huge mistake for Joe Biden and his campaign because it would, Democrats that are in denial right now would finally have to come to the realization that maybe Joe Biden and his administration are weaponizing the justice system. I'm just saying, like, there, there's no denying it at that point. You know, not all of Joe Biden's political rivals are guilty of something. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like they all didn't break the law. So it's like it's 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 obvious. You, you can't just I mean, it's so like Putin like it's so like we're in like some third world banana republic, man. Like this is I can't believe we're even talking about this. Joe Biden, you know, uh, uh, prosecuting his political opponents, yelling at his staffers because the it's not moving fast enough. I mean, what is this, man? What is this? So Donald Trump making the prediction that Kennedy will be indicted by Joe Biden's DOJ. That would be shocking if it happened, but it would be a death nail for Joe Biden's campaign because it would just people would be like, "Okay, you got a lot of people out there that love RFK Jr., man. Diehard fans. I know tons of them. Tons. Diehard fans of RFK, and they're all former Biden voters. I'm telling you, I don't know any former Trump voters that are voting for RFK. I maybe did in the beginning. Hell, I even considered voting for RFK in the beginning until they indicted Donald Trump. And then I'm like, oh, hell no. So this is, you know, this is uh, pretty concerning. It wouldn't be shocking to any of us that are listening if RFK was indicted somehow by you know, miraculously some some crime popped up and RFK was being investigated or indicted by the DOJ. Like it wouldn't be surprising to us, but I think it would just be a a huge shock to the system if Joe Biden and his DOJ went through with that. All right. Anyways, getting to the final story of the show, Trump reportedly gave generous donation to foundation that paid off family mortgage of slain NYPD officer Jonathan Diller. This is incredible. Uh, something that we've heard of Donald Trump doing before. You guys remember that story where he paid off the mortgage of the of the guy that that fixed his tire when he was broke down on the side of the road. Pretty incredible stuff. So this is a hat tip to Christina Layla at the Gateway Pundit. On Thursday, it was reported that President Trump gave a generous donation to Tunnel to Towers. Great organization, by the way. The foundation that paid off the family mortgage of slain NYPD officer Jonathan Diller. The Tunnel of Towers Foundation announced a mortgage payoff for the family of Jonathan Diller. Earlier this week, Jonathan Diller was killed by a career criminal with 21 previous arrests and nine felony charges during a routine traffic stop in Queens. Officer Diller left behind a beautiful wife and a baby boy. So sad, man. President Trump on Thursday arrived at the wake of slain NYPD officer Jonathan Diller. Biden was also in New York on Thursday. However, he was too busy attending a ritzy fundraiser with out-of-touch celebrities to make time for a fallen police officer. Joe Biden, Barack Obama, and Bill Clinton are at a $500,000 per ticket fundraiser with Lizzo. A $100,000 donation will get you a photo with Biden, Obama, and Clinton by famed photo ag Annie Leibovitz. Barack Obama followed feeble Joe Biden down the shorter staircase after they landed in New York City for their day at the hobnobbing with celebrities. So imagine that. So the exact time Donald Trump is going to New York to visit the slain officer's home, all right, to visit the family, Joe Biden 
you know, Joe Biden's out having a fundraiser with Lizzo, Obama, and Clinton, a, a fundraiser at $500,000 a ticket. Like, why is it so hard for these people to just see the, why this looks so bad? It is because they are so out of touch with real America. This is why they're so, to- they're so tone deaf with this stuff. I don't know how Donald Trump does it. I know he's got a terrific campaign. Donald Trump has always had a connection to the people. I don't know how he does it. He's a multi-billionaire, even more now, with the, with the opening of Truth Social. That whole ordeal made him billions of dollars overnight. But he just has this connection, man. He speaks like a regular person. This is what makes him so attractable. This is what makes him so likable by the people. And Joe Biden's going to go to a fundraiser in New York. In New York. I mean, it's just. It's so it looks so bad, so bad, man. And 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 it's like I said, it's a bittersweet thing because this officer had to die by the hands of somebody that shouldn't even have been out on the streets. But because Alvin Bragg. Or these these Soros these Soros funded prosecutors are too busy targeting Trump and Trump supporters and not fighting crime. An officer with a wife and a daughter, a wife and a baby had had was murdered. I mean, damn man. But this would be absolutely incredible if Donald Trump did pay off the mortgage of this of this home. I mean, it wouldn't be shocking to me. I mean, because, you know, Donald Trump didn't take any money as he was president, which is another bone I got to pick with Biden. Why the hell is this guy taking paychecks when he's worth, you know, millions of dollars? I mean, it's not like he's just worth one or two. I mean, no, he's worth in the tens of millions of dollars. Why are you taking a paycheck from the taxpayer, you fraud? I mean, come on, man. Donald Trump donates his his income, his salary to, you know, drug clinics and rehabilitation centers and Joe Biden just pockets it. And somehow Donald Trump's the bad guy. Why is Joe Biden taking a paycheck from the taxpayer? None of these people, I'm sorry, if you are president and you're worth, you know, tens of millions of dollars, you should not be taking a paycheck from the ta- from the taxpayer. Okay, you fraud. They already get treated like freaking royalty, which I think is a little, I mean, the money that we spend on the presidency and the exec, I mean, I get the executive branch and how important it is and they should have the best and the best. But ladies and gentlemen, the level of money we spend on our government is astonishing, astonishing. It is mind blowing. I mean, hundreds of billions of dollars, in some cases, just gone, lost. Where did it go? Nobody knows. We have such a dysfunctional government right now. It's absolutely insane. I mean, I was just reading an article and I was going to do it on the next segment, but hey, I might as well just do it now. There was a, um, well, I can't find it now, but it was like 200, the, the association of lost funds or some type of government watchdog group found that the government made $236 billion in improper payments in one year. Like that to me is nuts. Two hundred thirty-six billion, just gone in improper payments. What improper payments means? Nobody knows. I mean, it's just you know, it's so obvious, man. That the differences between the two is so obvious. The problem I have is that the closer we get to the election, the more desperate these people are going to get. And I find it so disgusting how they just expect Donald Trump to roll over and take all these prosecutions in the neck. Like, oh, no, you shouldn't want to delay these. You should just take it. You should just roll over and take it, Donald Trump. Let them throw you in prison. I don't think so. These people are nuts, man. We're dealing with some grade A Trump deranged mofos, man. These people are off their rockers. And I see it every day on social media. I seen one message today that said they should round up Trump voters and put them in re-education camps and be, to be deprogrammed. Yes, I seen that message. These are what this is how they think of of of, of you. These people are, are bona fidely nuts. And there's nothing that could be done for them except just, I don't know, a safe space, I guess. 
And if, in order for this to stop, like we said in the beginning, there must be retribution when Donald Trump wins. He must go after these people that did this to our system. These people that are trying this election strategy by weaponizing the justice system, these judges and the prosecutors and DAs like Jack Smith, Fannie Willis, Engeron, Judge, Judge um, Chutkin, all these people, there needs to be the biggest investigation in U.S. history to, to find internal communication, Slack channels, to find out if these people were indeed communicating with one another to orchestrate this strategy to interfere in the people's elections. Because if that's the case and this actually happened and there was coordination of all this, all these pieces were being coordinated somehow to try and kneecap Donald Trump and his campaign in order to sway an election, like all these people need to be charged and indicted for trying to conspiring to violate people's voting rights. I mean, we're seven, we're seven months away from an election and these people are, are trying to force Donald Trump into prison? What? I mean, are we in America? No. I mean, we are, but it seems like we're more in like, like the, the Soviet Union back in the 30s. This is what's happening in our country, man. And Democrats are just laughing like hyenas. They're a bunch of Marxists, man. Bunch of fascists, totalitarians. That's what they are. It's unfortunate, but I wanted to end the show with a little bit of hope. I guess I kind of went back into the, to the political drama. But if Donald Trump did end up paying this officer's mortgage, that would be a huge help to the family. Because, you know, if you're like me, you own a home, our biggest investment is our house. And so it's like every month that mortgage payment comes and you're like, man, it's by far your biggest payment you have. I mean, I, it's, for me, it is anyways. Um, and it would help so much if it was just paid off. I mean... And, and and these people can do it easy. Someone like Donald Trump that's worth what? What is it? Six billion now? He's in he's in the top 500 wealthiest people in the world. <laughs> Go figure. Like on the same day that Democrats trying to try to destroy Donald Trump and bankrupt him, he actually came out with three billion dollars richer. Isn't that amazing? You talk about making lemonade with some lemons, man. This guy's incredible. He's he's unlike anything we've ever seen. The, the history books are going to be talking about Trump for centuries, man. This guy is a true, true character. He is a leader. There is no doubt. This is what leaders do. They go to a slain officer's home and they pay off their mortgage so that his wife and his kid can have a roof over their head indefinitely. No matter what happens, all the mom has to do is pay the taxes and insurance. And I'm sure in New York, it's probably insane. But still, it's doable. You know, the worst thing that can happen is the child loses father, then loses house, has to switch schools. Like, you want to talk about uh, um, just a shock to the system. If Donald Trump and Tunnel the Towers manage to pay off this woman's, to pay off the, the mortgage for these, this family, God bless them. And we need more stuff like this. And I know Democrats are going to say, oh, it's a political stunt. Well, what do you think Joe Biden does? You know, he goes down to the southern border after spent after telling the the DHS to clean up the border for three days, goes down there when there's nobody for for photo ops. He just go. He just went to East Palestine, Ohio, for a photo shoot. You know, in one of the cleanest parts of the town. It's. Listen, like I've been saying, it is a no brainer. Who is the better leader? Who is the the better president? And for those of you out there that just can't manage to vote for Donald Trump, I'm sorry, but you need to put your country before yourself. That's that's essentially what what it's coming down to. At this point, a vote for Joe Biden means that you are putting your emotional feelings, your personal feelings, and grievances, and you know, Donald Trump's personal, Donald Trump's flaws as a man above the love for your country. And to me, that's just unacceptable. I can't do it. I'm not going to put my fellow Americans, okay, my neighbors, my kids, my, my family, I'm not going to make their life harder, okay, just because of the personal flaws of one man. It just, it doesn't make any sense, man. For the love, I wish, I wish people would just put their country before their own personal feelings. So, all right, ladies and gentlemen, that's all for today. Hopefully we, 
we touched base on everything we needed to, and I filled you in with pretty much all the information. Um, I'm going to leave all these articles in my podcast description. Like always, you guys go in, you read them yourself. There's a lot more to each one. Um, the RFK Jr. thing, that's quite interesting. It, it, it is clear and obvious. RFK Jr. is unequivocally a leftist now. He has moved straight left and he's telling the entire country which direction he's going. And so this is great news for Donald Trump, bad news for Joe Biden. So that was, I wanted to share that with you. John Eastman, that's going to be talked about. Um, like I said, it doesn't mean he's going to lose his license forever. I'm sure he's more than welcome to come here to Florida. We'd love to have you here. Everybody and their brothers moving here to Florida, folks. It is off the charts down here. It is you, the People can't get in fast enough. They're not building houses fast enough down here. And it's actually unfortunate for us that, you know, Floridians that already live here, because there's just people everywhere. They cannot, they cannot build out the roads fast enough to handle all the cars. The infrastructure is overwhelmed. I mean, it, it, it's, it's wild. But I'm glad. I'm glad Florida is the new California. What's crazy is when I first moved here over 10 years ago, I remember sitting at a bar and I, I told this old timer Floridian uh, when I moved here, it was, on, it was in Deerfield Beach. And I remember telling him that Florida is going to be the new California. And boom, here we are. We got all these people from L.A. to San Francisco, everybody and their brothers coming here to Florida. I mean, I can't tell you how many celebrities live here now. Um, as conservative celebrities as well. Uh, it, so it's, it's wild. It's good and bad at the same time. Ron Santos has a big homeowner's insurance issue. He's got to figure out here because it is a nightmare. Homeowner's insurance is killing people here. Like it is so bad. People are having to sell their homes to just to afford the homeowner's insurance. And, and maybe we'll get into that on one of the segments. I actually, that was my first show I did was the insurance crisis here in Florida. One of my most popular shows, by the way, the insurance. So maybe we'll get into it in, in, uh, in the next segment. I think it's important, but there's some fixes that they're working on. I think one in particular sounds pretty promising, but they got to do something. The homeowner's insurance crisis here is off the charts. And mind you, for, you know, people coming from up north, from Jersey and New York, or, you know, people that are obviously wealthy here in Florida already, they don't care. If their homeowner's insurance is five, six, eight, ten thousand dollars a year. But people like me, you know, average working class people, when their mortgage payment goes up six hundred dollars a month because of homeowner's insurance, that is a crisis, folks. And like I said, I know a lot of people that had to sell their home because they can't afford the insurance. It is off the chain. And we'll go through why exactly it happened, but Ron DeSantis has got to get on the ball with this, and I think they may have a resolution here coming up soon. But we'll talk about that in the next segment. Anyways, as always, thank you guys for tuning in. If you want to support the show, please follow the show. Uh, please download the podcast on all podcast platforms. Uh, if you want to follow the show, you can follow us on Rumble. I'd really appreciate that. That really helps. And if you want to get a hold of me directly, you can get a hold of me at stephentoryellowshow at gmail.com. I will talk to you guys here in a little bit. TGIF. I want you guys to have a good weekend. God bless you and God bless America. You guys have a good one. Bye-bye.